The primary competitive weapon that Google possessed was semantic. It used open, and all the positive connotations associated with it, to attack Facebook at what appeared to be Facebook's most vulnerable spot, the closed nature of its software universe. It was not a hypocritical ploy. From its birth, Google had been a devotee of the creed of open. More than any other company, Google had depended upon unrestricted access not only to the web, but also to the software created as open source, which it used for its search engine and other services, and to which it contributed new code. It created a free hosting site for open source projects. It hired as Google employees a number of coders who were leaders in prominent open source projects. And each year, it organized a summer of code, in which it paid hundreds of computer science students to work on open source projects. Google's credentials as an advocate of an open approach to software development were in good order. When open was used to apply to a social networking model, however, the adjective's meaning was ambiguous. The most fundamental way that the social networking world could be opened would be by endowing all social network sites with interoperability, permitting a member's data and web of relationships that were originally collected at one site to move with the user to other sites too, what publisher and commentator Tim O'Reilly calls data mobility. Open Social had a grand-sounding name, but in its initial announcement, it spoke of no such ambition. More modestly, it would attempt to provide software developers the standards for writing mini-applications designed to work within all social networking sites, making life easier for the developers by eliminating the need to customize software for each site. It was not designed to make social network data truly mobile. When Joe Kraus was asked on the eve of his announcement of open social why Google had not yet implemented open social capabilities on its own web properties to demonstrate the initiative's promise, he readily conceded that its absence was embarrassing. He added that his team was concerned about increased risk of privacy breaches and was moving slowly to ensure the integrity of the company's privacy protections. Trust builds up over a very long time, he said, and can be lost very quickly. A week before Facebook would tell the world about its new advertising system, Krauss predicted that, because they're a startup, Facebook would take on privacy risks that a publicly traded company like Google could not accept. He drew a surprising analogy when he offered up YouTube, by then a part of Google, as an example of a startup that, early in its history, had made a critical bet that an established company would not have made. They decided early on they didn't care about copyright issues. Huge risks, Krauss said. It turned out well for YouTube when it was acquired for $1.65 billion, but it was the exception. For most startups, the assumption of large risk does not turn out so well. The next week, on November 6, 2007, Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg ascended a stage in New York and portentously began, Once every hundred years, media changes, and offered Facebook's new advertising system as a once every hundred years media revolution. Unlike the previous century's advertising, based on broadcasting messages, Facebook's was based upon getting into the conversations between people. Facebook's new Beacon program offered advertisers the opportunity to track what Facebook members did on their websites and automatically inform the members' friends what they had purchased. Another part of Facebook's new advertising program would match advertisements to the interests that members disclosed on their profiles. Facebook members were not asked to grant permission for Facebook to send information about their online purchases to their friends, nor were they asked whether they were comfortable having advertisers use their most personal information on their profile to guide advertisers' pitches. Zuckerberg had no sympathy. There is no opting out of advertising. Beacon drew the most immediate attention, and little of it was favorable. Facebook tried to explain that Beacon had been designed for the convenience of its members, who, in Zuckerberg's words, wouldn't have to touch it for it to work. Many users did not want it to work, however. They were upset that their purchases were broadcast to their friends, whether they wanted that or not. The criticism was so intense that the company had to backpedal. 
Over the next few weeks, Beacon's design was changed and changed again. At the time it was introduced, Beacon was activated automatically and reported on the purchases of all members at the 40 participating sites unless the member specifically opted out and asked that his or her purchases at a particular site be excluded. Initially, no one could opt out of all Beacon sites with a single click, but under pressure, Facebook provided an option that allowed members to opt out completely. Then, Beacon became opt-in only, ensuring that only those who wished to participate would have their purchases broadcast. Facebook executives were loath to change because they were convinced that consumers would, as one put it, fall in love with Beacon once they became familiar with it. After damage to Facebook's public image was widely commented upon, Zuckerberg publicly apologized for the company's handling of the controversy. But the next month, when 60 Minutes featured Zuckerberg and Facebook, his contrition had disappeared, and he was again depicting Beacon as a service that members should appreciate. He said, I actually think that this makes it less commercial. I mean, what would you rather see? A banner ad from Bloomingdale's? or that one of your friends bought a scarf. Facebook's own sponsors, however, were not as certain as Zuckerberg that this service would be welcomed by Facebook members, and some backed out. Google was saved from committing a blunder identical to that of Facebook because it did not possess the information about who its users' friends were. In Google's early years, when it offered just web search and nothing more, the company was the target of criticism from some privacy advocates for permanently storing information about what users searched for. In retrospect, the alarm was premature, before Google really knew anything much about its users. Searching the web at Google was done anonymously, so in Google's records, search terms were accompanied only by a computer's internet address, such as 172.16.254.1, not by a person's known name. The only circumstances in which a Google user had cause to regret conducting a search were highly unusual, such as a 2003 murder case in North Carolina in which police seized computers at the suspect's house and found that Google searches had been submitted from one of the household's computers for neck, snap, and break, and for rigor mortis and body decomposition. The victim was the suspect's wife, who had been found dead floating in a nearby lake. The jury found the defendant guilty after only two hours of deliberation. In a strange way, the murder case and run-of-the-mill advertising on Google's search pages were similar. They used what was typed into the Google search box as the next best thing to seeing what was actually on the user's mind at the moment. For advertisers, Google offered a way of making a pitch with a precision never before possible. The advertisement was displayed only when the user had indicated an interest in that topic, such as Hotels Maui. The interest might not have been present five minutes before, and it might not be present five minutes later. But at the moment that the search for Hotels Maui was submitted, it was highly likely that the user, whoever she or he was, would be interested in Hotels on Maui. That close association between what was being searched for and the user's receptivity to advertising messages that were very closely linked to the search term held true so reliably that advertisers quickly realized that advertising on Google was a very efficient way of reaching prospects. The general public did not appreciate what Google had stumbled upon, a way to serve up highly individualized advertising to an audience of one at the best moment when a relevant topic was on the user's mind, not later, and achieving this without having to know anything about the personal identity of the user, age, gender, income, nationality, zip code, none of it mattered to Google's advertising engine. Google had all it needed to know, a search phrase, in order to match up the advertisement with the greatest likelihood of eliciting a response. Google's advertisements worked so well, in fact, without access to the identity of the person conducting the search, that Google executives thought Google would be able to brush off any criticism that its service placed its users' privacy at risk. As late as 2003, Google saw itself as a search company that had no reason to collect personal information. When Urs Hosel, a senior Google engineer, 
was asked at a talk about how Google safeguarded an individual's privacy, he explained that Google users did not log on to use the service, so nothing could be known about who they were. To illustrate the difference between Google and other search sites, Holzel pointed out that Google did not offer email, so user concerns about privacy were a little bit less of an issue than, let's say, if you had an email service. Of course, within a year, Google introduced Gmail, and a host of new services followed that required a Google user to identify him or herself. Earlier, Google had claimed it had no personal information about its users, so there was no way that information could be leaked. Now it did have that information, and it could no longer claim that a leak was an impossibility. What turned out to cause the most trouble for Google, however, was not a leak, but a deliberate decision by Google managers to apply a technical shortcut to accelerate its attempts to catch up with Facebook. Google suffered a public relations mishap in December 2007, a month after Facebook introduced Beacon, when it added a social network-like feature to its Google Talk program, which provided instant messaging and Internet-based telephone service. Google decided to automatically define anyone who had received a call from a Google Talk user to be, ipso facto, the user's friend. Google now began sending to these recipients items from another service, Google Reader, that were supposed to go only to people whom the user had explicitly designated as personal friends. Critics drew comparisons between this new Google feature and Facebook's Beacon. The Motley Fool wrote, Everyone's following Facebook these days, even down to its missteps. Like Facebook, Google had placed the onus on users to take action to opt out, rather than attempt to persuade users to participate through an opt-in system. Indeed, Google was so eager to create an instant social network for its users that it had made the foolish assumption that any online conversation, even with a former employer, could be treated as equivalent to induction into one's inner circle of confidants. The lack of readiness that had been apparent at the time of the announcement of Open Social continued to hurt the initiative. Google had released what it called version 0.5, which was far from being sufficiently complete to even be called beta. Developers who tried to build applications with the software discovered it wasn't usable, Krauss attempted to defend the open social software as merely a first version. We didn't call it 1.0, we called it 0.5, he said. We want our partners helping us to figure out what else it's missing and continue to develop it. In the meantime, Facebook had put the beacon messiness behind it and moved on to present a new challenge to Google and the Open Social Alliance. It played the open card itself, and announced it was opening up the Facebook architecture, offering to license its standards for third-party software applications to other social networking sites. This move placed it in direct competition with Open Social, as Facebook vied to have its standards adopted across the entire social networking industry. Taking a page from Microsoft's dog-eared playbook, Facebook was reclaiming the adjective open for its own use even though the source code remained firmly in Facebook's hands. The tussle between Google and Facebook over who could claim to be more open than whom was initially a matter of interest only to the digerati and software developers. But in early May 2008, MySpace and Facebook made announcements about steps that would allow their users' personal data to be used a little bit more widely than before. Then Google followed with its own announcement of the launch of Google Friend Connect, which went the furthest in opening up social networks so that users' data could be utilized elsewhere around the web. By utilizing the programming information that Facebook had made available to software developers, Google introduced a service that would let Facebook members pull their own data out of Facebook for use elsewhere. It was a brilliant move on Google's part putting Facebook's commitment to openness to a very public test. Facebook failed the test. Claiming that it had to look out for the privacy of our users, Facebook blocked Google Friend Connect from accessing Facebook data. The decision drew the ire of many commentators. TechCrunch founder Michael Arrington wrote, How dare Facebook tell me that I cannot give Google access to my data? The slippery adjective open 
was used in different ways by friend and foe in another competitive battle that Google launched in November 2007, in another industry dominated by closed networks, the wireless phone business. Google announced the formation of the Open Handset Alliance, with 34 inaugural members who would jointly work on the development of a new mobile phone standard, Android. The announcement sounded the theme of openness at every opportunity, open software, open device, open ecosystem. Google also announced it would bid in an upcoming FCC auction of Spectrum that could be used to establish a wireless network that would compete directly with the wireless incumbents. The wireless carriers treated the Google announcement as harbingers of change and all but conceded the need to open, or at least appear to open, their networks in ways they would never have permitted earlier. The year before, Chris Saka, a Google manager in charge of special projects, had received numerous complaints from the wireless carriers because Google had circumvented the carrier's tight controls on third-party software and directly offered customers its own software, Google Mobile Maps, for free and without having asked the carrier's permission. Saka had embarrassed the carriers publicly when he was speaking at Oxford University and extemporaneously told the audience in detail about the carriers' attempts to keep their wireless networks closed. He said, They're inserting themselves in between you and an application that you want. I think that has scary, scary implications. Saka's remarks were picked up by news media around the world, and many of his Google colleagues were upset with him fearing that the wireless carriers would exact retribution. He described his position at Google then as in the doghouse. Saka discovered, however, that some Google colleagues shared his interest in breaking the hold of carriers, and a group of volunteers within Google began meeting. Their work would eventually become the Open Handset Alliance. The prospect of having any impact at all on the wireless carriers still seemed remote. In the summer of 2007, Google proposed that the FCC require that users be permitted to choose their own phones to use on a new network that would be created by the winning bidder at the upcoming Spectrum auction. But Verizon Wireless had immediately brushed Google's proposal aside, arguing that opening a network to phones that it did not sell itself could compromise the network's integrity. It had even resorted to claiming that use of non-Verizon phones would weaken the nation's defense in an era of heightened national security concerns. Yet, shortly after the Open Handset Alliance was announced, Verizon decided, in November 2007, that opening up its network to phones purchased elsewhere did not present a problem after all. In a dramatic change of its position, it announced a new Any Apps, Any Device slogan. By the end of 2008, it planned to permit its consumers to purchase cell phones from any store and permit them to run any software they wished. There were a couple of qualifications. Verizon would still insist that the devices meet the minimum technical standard, which was not yet defined, and it appeared that it would treat its new bring-your-own customers differently from full-service customers. Still, its embrace of open, even if it turned out to be mainly rhetorical, signaled that the incumbent carriers no longer could easily defend their closed systems. Although Verizon had not agreed to join Google's Android initiative, Verizon did confer privately with Google, seeking advice about how to open its network, and Eric Schmidt declared the Verizon announcement to be a great step forward and used it to extol the virtues of the open network model, which creates better services for consumers, he said, as the Internet has demonstrated. Google's chief executive frequently pointed to the Internet as the world's most robust working model of an open network. He readily acknowledged Google's own indebtedness to the ethos of openness that had created the foundations of Google's own success, the Internet's infrastructure, and the open-source software that Google relied upon in its own operations. But Google could not claim that, among information providers, it best embodied the Internet's spirit of openness. That honor would more properly be conferred upon Wikipedia, which organized information in a system far more radically open than Google's, open to any contributor and to revision by any editor. As Wikipedia grew, its articles showed up prominently in many Google searches. 
A 2006 study of a thousand randomly selected topics covered by Wikipedia showed that the encyclopedia showed up either once or twice among the top 10 results in 88% of Google searches, and in a majority of cases was placed in first, second, or third position. Google became increasingly unhappy with the fact that it was sending its users off to a site that was strictly non-commercial, open editorially, but closed to advertising. Google's AdSense network, which placed advertisements on non-Google sites, could not penetrate Wikipedia, and that rankled. In December 2007, Google announced a new initiative, which invited anyone to submit to Google articles he or she had authored on any subject. The articles would be called NALS, a neologism meaning units of knowledge. Google's NALS experiment was another instance of moving beyond indexing information hosted at other sites to hosting the information on its own site. Google's Udi Manber said that a NAL was meant to be the first thing someone who searches for this topic for the first time will want to read. This was precisely how many Wikipedia users viewed Wikipedia articles. Google hoped to lure authors with two inducements that Wikipedia did not offer, sole editorial control over the null, and the option, if the author wished, to have Google advertising placed with display of the null, generating revenue that would be shared with the author. If Google succeeded in attracting contributors, it would be a simple matter for its nulls to show up prominently in Google's search results, allowing Google to retain users that would otherwise have been directed to Wikipedia's ad-free site. Wikipedia's very openness could turn out to be a great help to Google in building out its collection of nulls. Charles Matthews, who identified himself as a Wikipedia administrator and arbitrator, pointed out that anyone could legally copy the content of a Wikipedia page, which was not protected by copyright, paste it into a new Google null, add a simple credit, then place ads and laugh all the way to the bank. Google's Manber clearly anticipated that Google's nulls would likely be perceived negatively by critics as a program that would increase Google's proprietary hold over information. We do not want to build a walled garden of content, he said with an unmistakably defensive tone. Google will not ask for any exclusivity on any of this content and will make that content available to any other search engine. In this one case, yes, Google eschewed exclusivity and could claim a genuinely open policy. But this was not consistently the case and left the company susceptible to the criticism that it elected to be open only when it had fallen behind a rival in a particular area. Five years earlier, in 2002, Google had begun preparations to digitally scan every book ever printed, a project so daunting that no other company had seriously considered attempting it. By 2007, Yahoo and Microsoft had begun similar projects, but Google held an enormous lead. Danny Sullivan, a veteran observer of the search business, noted in November 2007 that Google was not anything resembling open in its book scanning project. Others had formed an open content alliance to make the contents of scanned books available as widely as possible, but Google had refused to join the alliance and instead built an insurmountable walled garden of content, forbidding other search engines from indexing the contents of its book scans. Sullivan challenged Google to show how committed it truly was to the principle of openness by joining the Open Content Alliance. Google seemingly heard the criticism and responded with an announcement in March 2008 that made it appear that the long wait was over. The company made available to outside software developers the programming interfaces that would enable everyone to obtain book info where you need it, when you need it. The Google Book Search team said that it had released the interfaces because we love books, and the company wanted to share this love of books and the tremendous amount of information we've accumulated about them. The tremendous amount of information that Google claimed to be excited to share turned out, however, to be extremely limited. Google offered access to the information on the book's title page, the Library of Congress catalog number, and a thumbnail image of the book. But the company did not permit outside developers to gain access to the actual text of the books that it had extracted from its scans. Dan Cohen, 
the director of the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, noted how little Google was providing and expressed his disappointment in a blog post entitled Still Waiting for a Real Google Book Search Programming Interface. For book searches, Google still occupied a position of competitive strength. For social networking, it was in a position of competitive weakness. Sullivan also called Google hypocritical for advocating that Facebook, the network with the most valuable social data about its members, open its data to open social. Sullivan asked, why didn't Google open up its index of web pages, which was the largest collection of any search engine, and create an open index alliance, available to competitors, and let the quality of search results be differentiated by the software used to analyze a common base of information? He was not the first to present the proposal. Wikipedia founder Jimmy Wales, among others, had raised it. Sullivan said it was a matter of consistency. If Google's going to push for those with existing advantages to open up through efforts like Open Social and the Open Handset Alliance, an Open Index Alliance just seems like fair play. It was a poke not a genuine challenge, and brought out the point that even Google was committed to an open approach only selectively, not across the board. No company was purely open, and no company was purely closed. No independent observer of the industry could dispute, however, that Google was more open than its closest rivals, and the computer industry as a whole was far more open than those it was encroaching upon, such as wireless carriers. Google's story was, in part, formed by its efforts to convince others, within the computer industry and without, that open networks were demonstrably superior to closed networks. Consumers have tended to gravitate to systems that provide more choices, and the evolution of technology was pointed in the direction of open. Page and Brin had been fortunate to come of age when they did, when it was possible to use a wide-open network of information the web, and use open-source software as the foundation for what they would build. To make full use of the web, they needed a lot of computing power. On this, they did not stint. They assembled a computing infrastructure that effectively permitted Google to move in many directions simultaneously, without worrying that they would run out of horsepower. How Google went about creating capacity would turn out to be highly unconventional and strategically important. Instead of treating computer hardware as highly complex works of engineering, delicate mechanisms that, should they fail, would have devastating consequences for Google's operations, and whose manufacture should be left to companies that do nothing but manufacture computers, Google decided to assemble its own machines. This has turned out well. In the course of developing and refining expertise on the hardware side of the business, Google has acquired another competitive advantage over its rivals in web services, providing the company with the ability to expand the range of its products at lower cost and without becoming reliant on outside service providers. It's what makes it possible for Google to think big. Chapter 2. Unlimited Capacity Once upon a time, computers were a novelty that were put on display for their looks. In 1947, when IBM's engineers built a new 120-foot-long machine, the Selective Sequence Electronic Calculator, the company understood that a computer could dazzle the public on the basis of its appearance alone. Part mechanical and part electronic, it cost $1 million to develop, and was ornamented with dials, switches, meters, and flashing indicator lights. CEO Thomas J. Watson installed it on the ground floor of IBM's world headquarters in Manhattan, providing passers-by on 57th Street with a window view. Every day, hundreds of people would stop on the sidewalk to gawk at it. The machine's impressive facade hid the fact that its designers rushed its completion. When a reporter from The New Yorker was given a tour with the machine's inventor, Robert R. Sieber, Jr., serving as guide, the visitor peered behind a panel and noticed some wires that were not attached to anything. Sieber nodded knowingly. Yes, it's a funny thing about those wires. Nobody knows what they're doing there. Placing its selective sequence electronic calculator in a highly visible location was a brilliant marketing stroke on IBM's part. 
In the popular mind, the machine's massive size and pulsing lights established what a computer was expected to look like. Strictly speaking, IBM's Colossus was a single-purpose calculator, but Hollywood copied its looks whenever a movie set required something that could impersonate a computer. Today, machines incomparably more powerful and versatile than the selective sequence electronic calculator sit on our laps. Hardware no longer dazzles. If, however, we could see all of Google's computers arranged in a single place, we could not fail to take interest. Their sheer collective mass would be stunning. Google is a company whose founders suffered privation as graduate students. That is, they did not have enough computers to carry out their research plans. When they started their own company, they seemed determined never to suffer hunger from resource shortages again. Google would be scalable, designed to expand its ability to search the web just as fast as the amount of information accumulating on the web grew. The Google founders were determined not to settle for being selective in search coverage. However large the web would become, and whatever types of information it would encompass, Google would strive not merely to maintain the quality and speed of its search abilities, but to use expansion as a means to actively improve quality. The more information that was fed into the Google search engine, the smarter it became. Page and Brin intuitively understood what others failed to fully appreciate. That search technology could be designed in such a way as to positively thrive when asked to organize the immensity of the entire web. Where other search engines were overwhelmed by the growing volume of available information, unable to distinguish web pages with the greatest likelihood of being useful, Google's PageRank system was conceived at the outset to squeeze clues about usefulness from the web with a sophistication that no one else had attained. The more pages its search engine was fed, the more clues PageRank could extract and use in sorting web pages for likely relevance. In this sense, Google's technology has an appetite of its own. When Brin and Page set about organizing the world's information, they made two foundational decisions that would turn out to have ramifications not only for their company, but for the broader universe of information, including the web. The first decision was to make Google's ordering of search results entirely a matter of mathematics. Once software formulas produced search results, Google would not permit any human editing to refine the results. They believed that a software approach to the problem of searching the web provided results superior to those that human editors could produce. It was also the approach that was best suited to be scalable, even if human editors were free of biases. They could not be hired fast enough and cheaply enough to keep up with the addition of millions and then billions of new web pages. The commitment to a hands-off mathematical approach to evaluating the world's information required Page and Brin to make their second fundamental decision, that Google's computers would be able to scale up as fast as the web was growing. Google would need a computing and storage system with the power and capacity to master questions that would address all of the world's information more completely and with better results than anyone else's. Speed was an important consideration. Users would not wait around to see search results that failed to appear instantaneously. Speedy delivery required speedy processing, which could be provided only by first investing in massive machine capacity. The Google founders were determined that they would not be forced by practical limits to settle for something less than their vision for all. This has required assembling what most likely is the largest cluster of computers in the world. Google could have elected to rely for its computing power on the most sophisticated hardware available on the market, designed to handle the most demanding processing needs and the highest volume of web traffic. Its rivals concentrated on the software side and let computer hardware manufacturers handle the hardware side. But scaling its operations is so deeply embedded in Google's conception of its mission, and scaling rapidly is so crucial to Google's differentiating its business from its competitors, that it decided to build its own machines, a path without precedent in the software industry.
By using the same standard components that are the heart of a personal computer and building the machines itself from the start, Google has been able to add capacity cheaply, effectively, and limitlessly. Having sufficient hardware to accommodate an ambitious project was an issue at the outset of the search engine research that Larry Page began as a Stanford graduate student, which was originally designed to traverse the web. He added Sergey Brin as a collaborator. The most interesting challenge for the two was indexing the entire web, not just a selective portion of it. As Google's crawler collected ever more web pages, Pages and Brin's research was hampered by the limited storage capacity of their machines. Google was run on a motley collection of machines in a dorm room. By early 1998, they had gathered 26 million web pages, which was about half the number that the established search engines like AltaVista had attained two years earlier. The Stanford students desperately needed more hardware. For three years, they recalled later, they snarfed a whole bunch of machines of all different types by standing at the receiving dock at Stanford, where packages arrived at the university. When they saw someone take delivery of 20 machines, they approached the responsible person to wangle use of a spare machine for their research. To increase their search engine's capacity, the two students spent $15,000 of their own funds, spread across three credit cards, for the purchase of hard drives that could store a terabyte of data. They were intent on improving the power of their search technology, but at this point, they had no intention of starting a search engine company themselves. Rather, they wanted to license their technology to other companies, and their site, google.stanford.edu, served as a demo site for their technology's searching prowess. It was Yahoo co-founder and Stanford alumnus David Philo who advised the pair otherwise. He told them they should go ahead and enter the search engine business, which would serve as the best way for them to continue to develop their technology and improve their chance of being able to license it in the future. In the meantime, a visitor to their Stanford site had to bring along some patience. The early Google search engine did not respond quickly. In early 1998, Google queries for common search terms took several seconds, sometimes 10 seconds, before results were ready for display. Observers of the search engine business at the time regarded Google as a low-traffic curiosity. But even receiving only one query a second, or 10,000 a day, it used fully one-half of Stanford University's entire Internet bandwidth, a fact that brought an end to the university's welcome. For this reason, in 1998, Brin and Page decided to move their operation off campus and accept the advice to formally found a company. Not only would the move relieve the university of carrying their network traffic, it would separate them from the non-profit world of academy and enable them to raise money from angel investors for more hardware and additional network bandwidth. Though they were venturing into the commercial world, they struck off on a markedly different course from that taken by other young Silicon Valley entrepreneurs at the time who were preoccupied with business buzzwords like eyeballs and with racing to a quick IPO. Brin and Page showed no interest in eyeballs or taking their company public. They weren't even interested in market share. They approached the business opportunity no differently than they had the research challenge. They were focused on building technology that would scale up as the web grew, without being limited by hardware or software constraints. Mastering the entire web interested them not because it offered the greatest likelihood of future profits, which did not seem to be the case at all in 1998, but because it was an absorbing technical challenge. Computer science, not business, was uppermost in the founders' minds. Having tried as graduate students to pursue their research with limited machine horsepower, the two young men set off to build a company that would invest in computer resources so improvidently that the machines would always be ample for whatever task they could conceive of, no matter how ambitious. The great irony is that their shunning of conventional cost accounting considerations, then and since, has enabled the rapid emergence of one of the most profitable businesses of the modern era. Initially, though, their ambition of scaling up Google's search technology quickly ran into serious problems. 
Expanding the number of pages included in the Google Index was easy enough. Their crawler had, by the end of 1998, brought in about 60 million web pages. But their systems choked when trying to perform the involuted calculations required by PageRank. The crawl would take 7 to 10 days to complete, but constructing the index and calculating page ranks could take weeks after that, or even longer. A disk error or transient problem in the computer's memory would corrupt the index while it was being built, but would be discovered only later. Then it would have to be rebuilt. As the size of the web page collection grew, the difficulties in creating the index grew exponentially. Once a crawl was completed, Calculating page ranks for every page dragged on beyond weeks into months. Performance issues were also becoming painfully manifest at the Google website. Word was spreading that Google's searches produced more useful links than those offered up by other search engines, and Google's traffic increased rapidly, from 10,000 queries a day in 1998 to 100,000 a day in 1999. Bryn and Page saw, however, that the infrastructure was not scaling up to fulfill their vision. They sought help from more experienced quarters, and in early 1999 met Urs Holzel, a Stanford-trained computer scientist who had received his Ph.D. in 1995 and was on the faculty of the University of California, Santa Barbara. Holzel spent one day a week at Stanford, where his wife was finishing her graduate program and Bryn and Page invited him to have a look at their systems. Like most computer companies that ran busy websites, Google placed its machines in rented space that was specially designed for computer servers separate from its own offices. The data center provided reliable power with backup systems in case of a disruption, as well as cooling systems that could handle, or at least were supposed to handle, the heat generated by the machines. Space was rented by the square foot, so tenants packed as much computing power as possible into their allotted space. Holzel was invited to take a look at Google's hardware, which resided in a data center in Santa Clara, about 15 minutes away, run by Exodus Communications, the leading data center operator. Google's tiny space contained four racks, stuffed with boards using PC components, which sat within two small cages. These were enclosures built with chain-link fencing that extended from floor to ceiling and were equipped with a locked gate. The fencing permitted air to circulate and heat to dissipate and also protected the machines from mischief at the hands of the other tenants, like eBay and Hotmail, whose machines sat nearby in similar enclosures. Google's hardware was exceedingly modest. When Bryn and Page offered Holzel a job in February 1999, he was attracted to the technical challenge of building systems that could scale. He also liked that Bryn and Page were no less interested in the technical issue than he was. He was glad they were not following the herd of dot-com entrepreneurs in pursuit of a quick profit and exit, though he was mystified about how Google was going to make money. Nonetheless, he signed on. The team agreed that the company's current index of 60 million pages was much too small. The new goal would be considerably larger, the nice round number of 1 billion pages. No one at Google or anyone else could measure the size of the web at the time, and for all anyone knew, the correct number of pages they should have aimed for might have been 300 million, 600 million, or 2 billion pages. We had no idea, Holzel said later. What they did know for certain was that, were Google to succeed in finding and indexing one billion pages, it would far surpass the size of the largest search index, AltaVista's, which covered 150 million pages. Aiming so high so early in Google's history also shaped its institutional culture in this formative stage, implanting the expectation within Google that the company should scale its systems well in advance of its competitors. Google's systems at the time, in 1999, were failing to keep up with 60 million pages, let alone a billion. Search requests came in slowly enough that Holzel could watch every one scroll by on his monitor. Even processing search queries that came in a relative trickle, the servers were taking three or three and a half seconds to respond to each one. When the requests arrived in a torrent, the system was overwhelmed and the site crashed.
When Marissa Mayer, employee number 20, arrived on June 24, 1999, for her second day of work at Google, the company had about 300 computers to handle search requests. And that day would be the first in which Google would receive search requests sent to it by its new affiliate, Netscape. Lacking a search engine of its own, Netscape worked with several search engines. Google had wanted to start off with a limited volume of queries from this new source and had directed Netscape to start off gently by sending it only one out of five search requests that came in. But Netscape forgot or ignored Google's wishes and sent Google all of its requests that day. It was too much. Google.com had to close. That morning, Mayer stopped by the company kitchen and noticed that Larry Page was standing in a corner of the room for no clearly visible purpose. She asked Page what he was doing. I'm hiding, he replied. The site is down. It's all gone horribly awry. Mayer said that seeing the CEO of the company in such a state led her to estimate that Google had about a 2% chance of succeeding. The core problem seemed obvious. A system cobbled together with inexpensive PC components was neither reliable enough nor powerful enough to handle the demands of thousands of queries a day. It simply could not scale. All of the major search engines and portals used commercially manufactured servers, machines engineered to serve web pages efficiently and at high volume. Their components met the most exacting specifications, minimizing the chance of failure. By contrast, Google was using cheap, unreliable hardware. When Hosel surveyed Google's systems, however, he deduced that the search engine's problems with response time were not rooted in the hardware. On the contrary, he concluded that Page and Brin had done their homework well, and that using PC components was, without question, the most cost-effective approach. The problems were in the software which had been written on the fly in a university environment and hadn't taken into account the flaws that would be exposed when the volume of queries went up or when a hard drive or other component failed. By rewriting all of the code, Holzel believed, Google could gain both speed and reliability without having to forego the savings from using PC components. After the overhaul of Google's software systems had been completed, Holzel explained in 2003 at a Stanford Computer Science Colloquium The great thing about PCs is they're easy to buy, they're cheap, they're relatively fast for how much they cost, but not the world's most reliable machines, so you have to expect them to fail. After gaining more experience, Google's engineers settled on a standard design that packed 40 or 80 servers into a rack, each loaded with the equivalent processing power of a mid-range desktop PC matched with a large disk drive. For about $278,000 in 2003, it could assemble a rack with 176 microprocessors, 176 gigabytes of memory, and 7 terabytes of disk space. This compared favorably to a $758,000 server sold by the manufacturer of a well-known brand, which had only 8 multiprocessors, one-third the memory, and about the same amount of disk space. Google thereby learned how to obtain greater performance for far less money than its competitors were investing. In spring 2000, Google took a step that put it ahead of many leading web companies then, and even ahead today. It opened a second data center on the East Coast, in addition to the original one that it had in California. This center was purposely duplicative in order to provide what engineers refer to as redundancy, unneeded capacity that operates in parallel and is always ready in case of system failure elsewhere. At Google, redundancy was spread not only across thousands of machines, but also across the two geographically separate data centers that gave Google the ability to suffer major problems at one site or the other, while providing continuous service to all of its users. Adding a second site might seem an essential requirement for any web company that wishes to provide uninterrupted service. And yet, as late as July 2007, Craigslist, Technorati, Second Life, Yelp, Live Journal, Red Envelope, TypePad, and other tenants of a $125 million data center in San Francisco, 365 Maine, went dark. Craigslist for 11 hours, 
When a power outage hit part of the city and the data center's diesel generators, which were supposed to provide a backup source of power in just such circumstances, failed. When Google added a second data center, it not only gained protection against disaster striking the original center, but also shortened the distance that bits had to be moved. As fast as electrons travel, physical distance still affects response speed. Reducing response time by even a fraction of a second mattered to users, as Google discovered when it ran experiments to see if users noticed a difference between 0.9 seconds on average to render 25 results on a search results page compared to 0.4 seconds needed to render 10 results. Users were conspicuously more likely to grow bored and leave the Google site after waiting that interminable 0.9 seconds. To speed the transport of bits, Google realized that it could open additional data centers all over the map and do so quickly because it did not need to build its own facilities. It could lease the excess capacity available at commercial data center facilities at ridiculously inexpensive rates. In this way, the timing of Google's expansion in the early 2000s was most fortuitous. The wild funding of dot-com startups and the companies that provided services to them, like data centers, had come to an abrupt end in 2001, coinciding with a steep plunge in the stock market. Data centers lost their tenants and were desperate to sign new ones. Google was at the right place at the exact right time. The company began proliferating data centers by renting more cages, then rooms, then floors of data centers, and then entire buildings. Its original landlord, Exodus, went bankrupt. So too did other data center owners from whom Google rented amid this artificial abundance. In 2004, in a talk Eric Schmidt gave at the Stanford Business School, he joked about Google's good fortune. While displaying a picture of a rack of servers that had wheels attached, he asked his audience, Anybody know why the wheels are so important? To roll the racks in? No. To take them out when the data center goes bankrupt. All our data centers have gone bankrupt. Because we use so much power and we negotiate such low rates. In fact, Google did not usually have to roll its racks out after the data center went bankrupt. Instead, it was able to negotiate better terms with the landlord for renting the space. All the owners asked of Google was rent sufficient to cover their costs. When it and other tenants filled in the space available for lease in 2003 and 2004, Google began to purchase the data centers at what were, in Schmidt's words, fire sale prices. Google also bought up cheap, unused fiber capacity that had been laid by others at the most exuberant point in the giddy years of the late 1990s, using it to connect the centers into a network. This made the scattered clusters of machines work effectively as one very powerful, very capable machine. Other computer service companies, like IBM or EDS, operated more data centers than did Google, but no one else had as many machines and as many centers running a unified set of software applications. Google did have to contend, though, with some problems that came with its reliance on facilities that had been built by others in a rush. Cooling was a vital function. When heat was not dissipated adequately, machines failed. Too many machines in too little space for the building's cooling system produced too much heat. Machine rooms that are unbearably hot for computers and humans alike have been a feature of computing since the earliest days. In 1950, the Univax 5000 tubes produced enough heat that the engineers that tended it worked in their underwear. Eric Schmidt once recalled how in the 1970s, as a young programmer, he had worked on a mainframe that had to be water-cooled and required elaborate plumbing. The problem of heat dispersal has not been solved with the increase in technical sophistication of the computer industry's semiconductors. In fact, the problem in some ways is getting much worse as machines have become ever more powerful. The faster a machine runs, the more energy it consumes and the more heat it throws off. Energy consumption has increased dramatically also because so many more transistors fit onto a chip. The effect is mitigated by the fact that chips also have shrunk, so power consumption for each chip went up 
only 400% when performance improved 20-fold. Still, the net increases in consumption remain enormous. As early as 2005, Luis André Barroso, a principal engineer at Google, predicted that the cost of supplying power for one of Google's servers could soon exceed the purchase price of the server. He imagined the possibility of bizarre business models in which a power company will provide you with free hardware if you sign a long-term power contract. Google explored energy-saving improvements in the design of the computer's power supply, which required using a more expensive component. The expense was quickly recouped with savings in energy costs. The company also looked at reducing its cooling needs and improving energy efficiency by retrofitting the data centers that it had purchased. But as Google's growing needs began to push against the capacity of its data centers, the company began preparations in 2004 for a new approach that would simultaneously ease pressure on its existing facilities and reduce its energy costs. It would build from scratch its own data center facilities for the first time and place them close to where power is generated. The first data center to be built was at a small town, the Dalles, Oregon, about 85 miles east of Portland along the Columbia River, and, not incidentally, home to the Dalles Dam, a 1.8 gigawatt hydropower station. The area also offered a fiber optic network that was already in place. This move opened the company up to new scrutiny. Up until February 2005, Google had been able to add data center capacity without drawing notice because its leasing contracts and real estate purchases were with private parties. The company took over existing facilities for which zoning approvals had already been obtained. But the Oregon project involved building a new facility, which required approval from local zoning authorities. Even so, Google proceeded by stealth. The necessary blessings were obtained, the crucial arrangements with the Bonneville Power Administration were smoothed, a threat by the Bush administration to privatize Bonneville and raise rates was quietly killed. All of the work to put the deal together was completed, while officials were bound by non-disclosure agreements that Google had them sign. The land sale was publicly disclosed only after it was completed, in February 2005. Even while construction was underway, the city attorney and the city manager were bound by confidentiality agreements that they had signed at Google's insistence. Purchases and permissions for additional built-from-scratch data centers were completed in 2007 in Lenoir, North Carolina, and Goose Creek, South Carolina, each center to cost $600 million. Then two more centers were placed in Pryor, Oklahoma, and Council Bluffs, Iowa. In each case, Google moved ahead with construction out of public view. Its stealth, combined with the tax incentives that the company received, created an image on the editorial pages of local newspapers in these areas of a sinister corporate octopus moving soundlessly, wrapping its tentacles around a small, defenseless community. Negotiations between two parties could never be truly fair if one party seemed to the other to have infinite wealth. Tommy Tomlinson, a newspaper columnist for the Charlotte Observer, reasoned that Google was owned by billionaires who could afford the best negotiators in the world. After listing the various tax abatements provided to Google by local and state officials that could cost more than $260 million, he wrote, It appears our local boys got schooled like a church leaguer guarding Michael Jordan. Google attempted to defend its honor and good name in North Carolina in a letter to the editor of the Charlotte Observer. Lloyd Taylor, Google's director of global operations, explained that Google had paid county governments millions of dollars to cover expenses and infrastructure improvements related to the project, and the tax reductions that it had been granted merely put North Carolina on par with other states. Without those concessions to level the playing field, it would have been a better business decision for us to do our expansion elsewhere. Whenever state and local governments provide incentives to persuade a large corporation to place a new facility in their bailiwicks, the advocates point to the economic benefits that come with new jobs. In the case of Google's data centers, however, local advocates cannot rely on the standard arguments to defend industrial incentives. 
Few new jobs will be generated by a $600 million Google data center. The expansion of Google's physical capacity to hold the entire universe of knowledge requires few humans to tend the machines. Hardware systems that expected high rates of failure had redundancy built into their designs and actually needed fewer attendants than those systems that lacked redundancy and came to a halt if a component failed. In a public talk in 2005, Urs Holzel projected on the auditorium screen a photograph of an interior view of a Google data center. It was so dark that nothing much could be seen. He explained, We actually do have the lights off more and more because there is nobody in the room and we want to save power. 200 jobs was the number that Google said it expected to create when one of its new centers was fully operational. How many of this small number would be hired locally wasn't announced. The Charlotte Observer's Tomlinson pondered the mismatch between the skills that Google needed and those in the possession of the unemployed in Lenoir and concluded, Google needs computer guys, and Lenoir has laid-off furniture workers. God bless them if they can learn how to run a server farm. Google was going to be criticized if it failed to hire locally and criticized if it did hire locally, poaching talent from neighboring businesses, as when Google's center at the Dalles hired an IT expert who had worked at nearby Orchard View Farms. Whether or not Google could offer examples of local talent doing well at Google's facility did not really matter in terms of the execution of the company's strategy. Though Google's local critics did their best to find a damaging argument in favor of blocking the centers, they came up short. Data centers at dispersed sites constitute the essential post-industrial infrastructure relied upon by the information age economy, just as steam boilers and steel rails were the indispensable infrastructure for the railroad age in the 19th century. Google came to understand before its rivals how important centralized computing capacity would be because its founders also appreciated earlier than their rivals that the Internet was evolving into a realm of ever-deepening complexities. When Google was founded, the web was an online reference disk. But over time, the full Internet, including services that were invisible to users as well as visible, was becoming a complete virtual world, existing in parallel to the physical one. It was becoming incomprehensibly immense, as more of life was lived online. The user's dependence upon a search engine to sort through the universe of possible destinations could only grow. Google intended to remain the one indispensable guide. In April 2004, Eric Schmidt explained Google's overarching aim of trying to make Google be a place where people live online. In hastening that process, Google had to make practical preparations in the physical world in the form of adding more hard drive platters mounted on racks that sat securely within a heavily fortified building and located geographically as close to users as possible to minimize response times. Google's principal competitors, Yahoo and Microsoft, have now also come to the realization that data centers are crucially important to their futures and are following Google's path, building their own centers. But they are well behind. Google's executives do not see its current building boom as a blip that will soon subside. The company expects that we will move more information that we are accustomed to storing on computers in our offices and homes to servers in centralized locations, like Google's. It also expects us to digitize more information that currently resides on paper, and this too will require building more data centers. The popularity of online video also creates demand for more centers. Video creates files far larger than those holding text. With its experience as the leader in building out its own data center infrastructure, Google now looks at the addition of a new data center as a matter of routine. Schmidt has described the process as simple. Fill a large building with servers, then plug in to the overhead power line. Repeat as necessary. At Google, Page and Bryn, the two former students, created a software company that built its own tools. By developing the ability to stamp out data centers cost-effectively in bulk, Google has the means to expand its data collection without limits, to scale its business without pausing. 
As fast as its business has grown, the company has never run out of capacity and been forced to hold off on the introduction of new services. Nor has the company ever been forced to cancel plans to build a new center or relocate because of local opposition. This permits the company to expand and expand and expand. It also provokes a growing nimbus of worry among some users and many privacy advocates as they watch the data centers multiply and wonder how Google intends to make use of all the data, so much of it personal, that it is accumulating in its digital storehouses. Google could attempt to put the public's anxieties at ease by putting its operations on public display, even if behind a window, as IBM did in the 1940s. But Google's executives have gone to extraordinary lengths to keep the company's hardware hidden from view. The facilities are not open to tours, even to members of the press. I requested a mere five-second poke-my-head-in-the-door glimpse and was turned down. A Google spokesperson said that Google executives believe that their hardware expertise provides the company with a competitive advantage that would be eroded were other companies able to get a glimpse inside even if it was through a journalist's eyes. Secrecy is the norm in any highly competitive business environment, of course, and especially so in the technology industry. But even so, Google stands out for its secrecy. Guided by its founding mission to organize all the world's information, Google has created storage capacity that allows it to gain control of what its users are thinking and doing in a comprehensive way that no other company has done and to preserve those records indefinitely, without the need to clear out old records to make way for new ones. Moreover, Google differentiates its service by refining its own proprietary software formula to mine and massage the data, technology that it zealously protects from the sight of rivals. This sets up a conflict between Google's wish to operate a black box, completely opaque to the outside, and its users' wish for transparency. At the very least, users would like Google to disclose what protections are in place to safeguard their privacy. It is also natural that users would be curious about the machines that hold their personal data, as well as about which employees within Google have access to that data, and about the risks that it might be leaked, stolen, or transferred, for example, to a government agency that requests it. How can users be certain that their personal information won't be put to uses to which an individual would never willingly consent? Privacy concerns extend across all Internet companies, but those concerns are greatest where personal information is gathered in the largest pool. This makes the stewardship of Google's machines a subject of public interest. Whatever is behind a door that is intentionally kept closed will appear sinister, whether deservedly so or not. For the sake of improving its public image, it's possible that Google may relent and open its doors, at least enough to afford a peek inside. The fact that its data centers run dark, without attendance, does not itself settle the question of whether a rogue Google employee could snoop on users' activities. But more openness would bring a measure of reassurance to users who are concerned about what happens at Google out of view. Were Google willing to open up more, it would be able to point to the absence of human intervention in the daily operations of the company. The Google model depends on automation to scale. It is software, not humans, that does the work at Google's information factory. Chapter 3. The Algorithm Anyone can call up the Google homepage and summon the full power of Google's search engine without having to sign in or provide any personal information. Gender, race, age, education, occupation, all remain unknown. The search engine has only the search phrase itself to work with, along with an unhelpful Internet address of the machine that sends in the search request. Google's skill at fielding search requests that are submitted anonymously originates in the founder's focus on extracting as much information as possible from the website rather than from the user's side. An algorithm is a set of rules for solving a particular problem. It's the essential building block used in constructing complex computer software. 
Google's PageRank algorithm, the formula that analyzes the links that point to a web page to discern the relative reputation of one page over another, draws on information that sits on web pages. Google's search engine does not need to know anything about the user other than whatever can be guessed is on the user's mind when the search phrase was typed in. Developing a core strength in searching anonymously would turn out to help Google greatly in other ways that were never anticipated at the time of its beginnings. As the online world has expanded exponentially and the amount of personal information collected online has grown apace, Users have watched with queasiness as one company after another, whether accidentally or intentionally, has released information that users regard as personal and private. With each breach, privacy concerns are heightened, and users look for assurances that their personal information will not be disclosed. Fortunately for Google, its search service does not need to know who its users are in order to perform well. Google's impersonal mathematical approach to search also provides it with the ability to serve up advertisements that are tailored to a search, rather than to the person submitting the search request, whose identity would have to be known. In this way, Google is well positioned to compete for online ad dollars with social networking sites like Facebook, which offer advertisers the opportunity to target particular users, but only by selling access to information that users regard as personal and sensitive. Google's advantage over social networking rivals in not needing its users' personal information to perform web searches is mitigated, of course, by Google's expanding into many other services beyond search, in which the information that it holds is extremely personal, such as its email service, Gmail. Google is aware that users may worry that its employees could snoop at will in the email of the company's users. This problem is not unique to Google. Employees at Microsoft, Yahoo, and AOL can rummage through users' private email messages too, and these services handle a greater volume of email messages than does Google. So it is a bit unfair for Google to be singled out by users of email who are worried about strangers surreptitiously reading their personal messages. For its part, Google's attempts at reassuring the public have been, at best, only partially persuasive. The company says that only a small number of Google employees are permitted to access email stored by Gmail, which is good. Not so reassuring, however, is the way the company has defined specific categories of users whose email is placed off-limits to a Google employee. Any public figure, any employee at a particular company, or any acquaintance. Does this forbid recreational reading of email messages of strangers? Is the stated punishment for violating this policy, termination, severe enough to be an effective deterrent? Has unapproved snooping ever been detected and a Google employee dismissed? Would the user whose email was rifled be informed? As much as Google protests that such concerns are unfounded, breaches at other companies create worries that extend to every company that stores users' personal data. Even though it was Facebook's employees, not Google's, who were reported in 2007 to have looked up user profiles, in one case for the purpose supposedly of examining prospective candidates for dates, or faked email messages, or changed users' profile photos, Google's privacy practices have come under increasing suspicion as well. When Google was founded, Page and Brid did not have to worry about privacy concerns. They were single-mindedly devoted to automating the process of judging web pages. Their approach was unlike that of Yahoo, the leader in the first generation of web guides, which relied upon human editors to maintain a hand-culled directory of websites. The story of how Google displaced Yahoo and gained the position of preeminence is instructive in the way Google used computer science more adroitly than much larger incumbents. Google began with nothing more than its search engine, which performed the unglamorous work of indexing and analyzing web pages. In 2000, the company struck a deal with Yahoo, then the far larger company, to perform web searches for Yahoo's users. It was not a financial boon for Google, nor did it help it establish its own brand identity. Yahoo's users did not even know that Google was the wholesale supplier of search results, which were presented as if Yahoo had found them. 
What the deal did provide Google was something that was strategically more important than sales or brand awareness. It gave Google a high volume of search queries, which was the raw material needed to improve its search technology, with its built-in ability to turn quantitative increases in data into qualitatively improved results. As Page and Brin's technology got smarter, as it worked with more information, it was only natural that the two sooner or later would give thought to how they might get their hands on as much raw data about anything and everything as they could. How the different bodies of information would be interconnected was not regarded as the most pressing problem. Collect first, analyze later. If the information was not already in digital form, then Google would spend whatever was required to digitize it. The company's earliest experience with the web had shown the wisdom of gathering more information than anyone else and letting the size of the collection work in one's favor in many ways, producing a more dense collection of cross-references, contributing to the most sophisticated ranking of search results in the world. Google understood, well before its chief rivals, Yahoo and Microsoft, noticed, that an information collection that attempts to be complete expands on a scale far beyond anything that can be curated by human editors. Just as the human mind depends upon neural connections that develop spontaneously, so too digital collections of information will rely on interconnections that are created by software without human agency. Software algorithms are created by humans, but the complexity of the end products far exceeds anything that human creators could produce manually. In building a company, Page and Brin used many different algorithms, but in a philosophical sense, the different formulas were not material. All of Google's algorithms could be said to be pieces of the algorithm, shorthand for the software formulas that the Google founders believed were the best means to solve any given problem. Their confidence in the power of the algorithm led them to adopt a controversial corollary, that the results produced by the algorithm should not be edited, adjusted, or touched in any way by human intervention. The only way to scale their systems to handle all of the world's information was by automating all processes. The algorithm could be manually adjusted and improved, but the tinkering would be with the algorithm itself prior to conducting a search. Were they to permit second-guessing the algorithm and tinkering with search results after the search, such human intervention would slow the system and hobble it. At Google, achieving scale was paramount, and that required relying upon wholly automated processes.